Hello and welcome to the second part of the structure determination series. So in this one we're going to be looking at NMR, COM13 and PROTON, so nuclear magnetic resonance. So it's how the MRI machines in hospitals work, just they drop the word nuclear because everybody freaks out. And it's one of the great tools in sort of determining compounds in organic chemistry. So at university I used to love these, they are just little puzzles to be put together. Once you've got the hang of them, it is just like a little game doing it. So I'll start off with some of the trivia first, which you need to be aware of. So the standard, which, well, it's used in some machines, some of them are phasing it out these days, is tetramethylsilane. You do need to know the actual name. You'll sometimes see it shortened to that, just TMS. Do not write that in your exam. I have seen mark schemes which do not allow it. So either write the full name or just shorten the structure down to whoops, that. So just the silicon with four methyls around it. Now why the standard is used, why this particular one, there is only one environment for the hydrogens there. I'll come on to what I mean by environments in a second. And obviously there's 12 hydrogens in that environment, so it gives a nice strong peak, which means you only need to use a small amount of it in the machine. The other properties of that standard, it's inert, it's not going to react with your substance, it's non-toxic, it's not going to kill you touching it. And in terms of the parts per million scale, as you can see here, what we'll come on to with a proton one in a second, it is taken as the, the value zero. Rather than using awkward sort of frequency numbers in the machine, this is given the number zero and everything is measured against it. Now it is close to all the organic compounds, but it will not overlap them. So as you can see on this scale here, it is quite close to it, but it does not interfere with any of the peaks. So that's the standard there, tetramethylsilane. Across here we've got some of the solvents which are used. So the solvents for everything to dissolve in, I've listed two there, there are plenty. As long as they don't contain hydrogen which could start interfering on the proton anymore, then it can be used. So similar properties it must have, obviously inert, you don't want it to react with your substance. Volatile, so you can just boil it off later, etc. Now you'll notice the D there, the D is deuterium, it is an isotope of hydrogen. Again, I'll come on to why that can be used in a second. So when you're doing the actual NMR, you do not need to know how the machines work. Um, in simple ways, then, if you imagine two magnets in north and south, obviously low energy, whereas north, north, high energy. So everything that either has an odd atomic number or an odd mass number will have what's called spin. Now, if the spins... Um, or sort of lining up or unaligned with the field then they'll have different energies and it's the actual flipping between these energies which can be measured so that's very simplistic you can read up about it if you wish and um, if you go on to doing further analytical chemistry you'll definitely need it so this is why we can use either proton NMR or carbon 13 because obviously odd mass number there the hydrogen has an odd atomic number and an odd mass number now, deuterium being an isotope of hydrogen, is like that. It does still have spin, but it spins at a very little amount. The energy difference between them is extremely small in terms of when you look at an NMR machine, the peaks would be very tiny and you can more or less just drown them out. So that's why deuterium can be used instead of hydrogen. Now we look at carbon-13 first. So carbon-13 spectra are very simple. They're like the baby version of the proton one. In terms of when you see a carbon-13 spectra, you'll notice on the proton one, when I come into it in a second, that some of the peaks are kind of chopped up. They are split. The carbon-13 one, what you will see, will not be. They are the decoupled version. In other words, every peak will just be a single line. What those peaks represent is the amount of carbon environments. 
They do not represent the amount of carbons. And they may do, but it will be a coincidence. It is just the amount of environments. And in terms of where those environments lie on the scale, a carbon-13 one is usually between 0 and 200, rather than this being a proton NMR. It tells you how de-shielded it is. What I mean by de-shielded is if the carbon's attached to something highly electronegative, i.e. attached to the oxygens here, then it's going to be pulled further downfield. It's going to be having the electrons pulled away and it exposes the, the nucleus with its spin a bit more. But in terms of how that affects you with the numbers, you don't need to go into. But further downfield, attached to a more electronegative, further upfield, then it's called shielded because it's got all of its electrons wrapped around it. So the amount of environment. So look at this compound here. So diethyl folate, so DEP, something shown to. I've taken this from one of the past exam papers, can't remember which one off the top of my head. And the questions in exam papers for carbon-13 are just usually along the lines of count up the amount of carbon environments, which we'll do here, or sort of draw an isomer of this structure with X amount of environments. So similar style questions, we'll do both. Now, I'll start with the CH2 here, just to get you into the hang of what environments means. You need to look at everything which is attached to it, not just directly, but the full chain length which comes off. So this CH2 here, it's got a CH3 to its right hand side. On its left hand side, it's got the O, carbon, double bond, O, carbon there, all of that ring going round it. So as I said, you need to look at the full thing coming off. The CH2 down here, on its right hand side, it's got a CH3. On its left, it's got an O carbon, double bond oxygen, all going round the same. So you'll notice both of these CH2s are connected to exactly the same thing. So they will be in one environment. In a carbon-13 spectra, they will appear as one peak. So likewise, the two CH3s on the end there, connected to everything the same. So you're looking for symmetry, really. So they'll be one environment. Another environment there, those two carbons are going to be the same. These two are going to be the same. Likewise. And finally. So you'll notice, despite the fact of having 12 carbons, there will only be six peaks of piano carbon-13 spectra. So six environments. So you would need to use mass spec or be told a molecular formula like that to know how many carbons are actually in those environments. Moving on to another style question. So this question is something like, here is a primary amine, it has three carbon environments. One, two, three. And it could be something like, draw an isotope of that which is also a primary amine which still has three carbon environments. So you need to start off with what you've been told. You were told it's a primary amine, so one carbon connected to it. And it can only have three environments. Now, some of this will just be trial and error. You will not, so, there isn't a, a method to always work it out correct each time. It's just playing around with little jigsaw pieces in your head, putting them together. Does it fit? Yes, there you go. If it doesn't, take it apart, try it again. You'll pick it up just becoming quicker and quicker at it. So I could just try something like that straight off. So I've used up my five carbons. If I count the environment, well, one there, two there, because these two are going to be the same, three, four environments, so no, it doesn't fit. That would be incorrect. Rub it out, try again. So I'll try something like that now. One environment two environments. Each of these methyls around the edge there, the CH3s, they are all in the same environment because they are all connected to this carbon which then comes off. So all of those are in one environment. So three environments, primary amine, isomer of it, there you go, there's the answer. So like I said, you'll get used to it, just picking up symmetry, working out jigsaws in your head. 
Now the Proton NMR Spectra here, so this is the one which does give you a lot of information. There's a few key things with this. You are looking at environment, splitting and integration. So environment for the protons similar to the actual carbon 13s. In terms of, um, if I use an example here, so the hydrogens on these CH3s in the same environment hydrogens on those CH2s, same environment, etc. You will be dealing with splitting up to singlet, doublet, triplet and quartet. So you'll not be dealing with the pent, sextet, etc. things like that. And you'll be dealing with um, non-equivalent hydrogens. So you don't have to worry too much about something like that because these the hydrogens on these CH2s are in the same environment they will not split each other but you'll not get questions in the actual exam about things like that so don't worry too much but I will be teaching you how to do them in any case so what I'll do is we'll just analyze this actual spectra here and sort of go through the theory of it one thing just to point out sort of a, a general knowledge style before I start again you'll notice we've got some oxygens here there is no OH group in this I will tell you that if you are sort of given a combined set of spectra and the IR tells you there is an OH group one of the things which you can do with a proton NMR spectra to sort of confirm that the hydrogen which is attached to the oxygen like that, will be rapidly flicking on and off with other protons. What you can do is what's called a D2O shake. So it's basically just where water has had its hydrogens replaced with deuteriums. If you mix some of that in, then that hydrogen could flick off and swap with the deuterium there. Now, like I said before, deuterium gives a very weak signal. So if you saw an OH signal, which was just a little sig uh, singlet, because the OH doesn't split with anything, do a D2O shake, it will disappear. So it's, it's the only real bit of trivia what you need to know with this. Now, you may need an actual ruler in the exam for this. I've told you the integration numbers here. If I did not, then you may sometimes see some little lines on the actual graph like that, all usually connecting to one straight thing. These are the integration lines. They tell you the ratio of the amount of hydrogens in that environment. Notice ratio. So similar, that just tells me a three to two to three ratio. If the mass spec had told me 16 hydrogens there, then effectively it would be six hydrogens in this environment, four there, six there. But as we've been told, eight, then the integration also matches the amount. Now the environment, as you can see, we've got three peaks here. So we are told there is three hydrogen environments. And you'll notice some of these are split. Now splitting comes from... So ethanol here, so this is not ethanol, I'm just giving an example. These hydrogens here are in different environments. You do not count this one, remember what I just said, OH doesn't get involved in splitting. The hydrogens on this CH2 will split the hydrogens on this CH3. Likewise, the hydrogens here will split these. There is what is called the N plus 1 rule. You must remember that. So these CH3s, because they are next to two hydrogens, two plus one, it will split into a triplet. So it looks something like that. In terms of the ratio between these lines, that's where Pascal's triangle comes into it with maths. And the CH2 here, it's next to three hydrogens. So three plus one, it will be split into a quartet. If ever you see peaks like this on an actual spectra, triplets, quartet, it usually indicates CH3, CH2 next to each other, usually.
Right, so putting these pieces together. So as we just said there, CH3, CH2, because um, we've got an integration value of three, it's split into a triplet, an integration value of two split into a quartet. So I'm going to try and piece together what I think this um, molecular formula actually is using this proton NMR. So I think these two are that. Now notice I've got a singlet across here. So a singlet, the n plus one rule. If it's got one peak, then it must not be next to any hydrogens. So it cannot be joined to those, otherwise it would be split. Now I've also got a fourth carbon. And I've also got two oxygens. So I need to think about how I can put these actual pieces together. There is a couple of different ways of actually putting this compound together. Using the information what I've said so far about splitting and integration, you would not be able to get the right answer. You need to actually use the environment as well. Similar to the carbon-13, if something's attached to a highly electronegative group, it'll be pulled further downfield, it'll be de-shielded. The positions of these will tell us which of the actual compounds we are looking at. So there is two options for how I could stick this together. As such, or... like that. So what I would do is you look in your data booklet, you do not need to remember the numbers, and this peak here, we know this is the CH2 because it's split into a quartet intensity 2. So the CH2, what I could look for is when it's joined to this, where should it appear at? Or when it's joined to the single bond O, where should it appear at? I can't remember the numbers exactly, I know it's somewhere near the 2 to 2.5 region. Um, or when it's actually joined to the C double bond O with the O there. So that would be the right answer, whereas when it's joined to the single bond there, I think it appears around the, the 3.6, 3.7 region. So that is your actual compound. So integration, environment, and splitting are the order of the day for the proton NMR. Um, so that's pretty much it, just practice getting some spectra like that, get on spectra school, brilliant website, pull it up and just play around, analyse the compounds. Thank you.